Ahang bante ti sarani na saha pancha silani yachami duti ampi ahang bante ti sarani na saha pancha silani yachami tati ampi ahang bante ti sarani na saha pancha silani yachami namo tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudhasa 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 Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa <coughs> Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranangga Chami Buddhang Saranangga Chami Dhammang Saranangga Chami Dhammam Saranangga Chami Sanghang Saranangga Chami Sanghang Saranangga Chami Duti Yampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Duti Yampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Duti Yampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Duti Yampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Duti Yampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Duti Yampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Tati Yampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tati Yampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tati Yampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tati Yampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tati Yampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Tati Yampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Tati Saranagamanang Gachami Ama Bante Pana Tipata Veraman Sikaha Padang Samadhyan Pana Tipata Veraman Sikha Padang Samadhyami Adinna Da Sikha Padang Samadhyan Adinna Da Adinna Da Na Veraman Sikha Padang Samadhyami Kami Sumitchaha Jara Raman Sikha Padang Samadhyam Kami Sumitchaha Jara Raman Sikha Padang Samadhyam Musavada Raman Sikha Padang Samadhyam Musavada Raman Sikha Padang Samadhyami Sura Miraya Manjapamadatana Dhamani Sikha Padang Samadhyam Sura Miraya Manjapamadatana Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Imani Pancha Sikha Padang Silena Sukating Yanti Silena Bhoga Sampada, Silena Nibuting Yanti, Tasma Silang Sodha Ye. Sadhu, 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 Sadhu. Okay, page 925, Sutta 115, Bahu Datuka Sutta, The Many Kinds of Elements. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jata's Grove, an Appendicus Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, bhikkhus, whatever fears arise, all arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Whatever trouble arise, all arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Whatever calamities arise, all arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Just as the fire that starts in a shed made of rushes or grass burns down even houses with peaked roofs, 
with walls plastered inside and outside, shut off, secured by bars, with shuttered windows, so too bhikkhus, whatever fears arise, all arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Thus the fool brings fear, the wise man brings no fear. The fool brings trouble, the wise man brings no trouble. The fool brings calamity, the wise man brings no calamity. No fear comes from the wise man, no trouble comes from the wise man, no calamity comes from the wise man. Therefore, bhikkhus, you should train thus. We shall be wise men, we shall be inquirers. So rather than fear, the word is probably better translated as danger. The word bhaya in Pali can be translated as either fear or danger, and danger fits the context a lot better here. The word inquirer is vimangsaka. I don't have a really good translation of vimangsa, but it's basically wisdom. And so it's sort of just another way of saying a wise man, a wise person. But it relates to investigation and just the discernment. I would probably relate it to discernment. And it's just another synonym for being wise. This is an oratory skill. You don't have to read too much into these things. The same with the list of three, danger, trouble, calamity. It's, it's just a way of speaking. You don't have to look into it and think of three different types of things. It's just uh, a way of impressing your teaching upon your audience. Like I just did there. I said the same thing at least twice. But why would fear be a wrong translation here? I mean, to me, it makes sense. That's only it really the doesn't, fool. It doesn't actually make sense. Mm-hmm. Because you can't bring fear to someone. Fear is something that arises. You can bring danger to someone. Mm-hmm. Fear is not something you do. Right? Not something you bring about. Fear is a response. But it also doesn't fit with the list. as It's not it's not in the same category as, as calamity or trouble. It's a totally mm-hmm. different kind of thing. Um, which makes it clear that they're using it to mean danger. Baya often means danger. And the relationship is that, well, danger is fearsome. Yes, thank you. When this was said, the Venerable Nanda asked the Blessed One, in what way, Venerable Sir, can a bhikkhu be called a wise man and an inquirer? When, Ananda, a bhikkhu is skilled in the elements, skilled in the bases, skilled in dependent origination, skilled in what is possible and what is impossible, in that way he can be called a wise man and an inquirer. The elements. But, Venerable Sir, in what way can a bhikkhu be called skilled in the elements? There are, Ananda, there's 18 elements, the eye element, the form element, the eye consciousness element, the ear element, the sound element, the ear consciousness element, the nose element, the odor element, the nose consciousness element, the tongue element, the flavor element, the tongue consciousness element, the body element, the tangible element, the body consciousness element, the mind element, the mind object element, the mind consciousness element. When he knows and sees these 18 elements, a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements. But Venerable Sir, might there be another way in which a bhikkhu can be called a skilled in the can be called skilled in the elements? There might be Ananda. There are Ananda these six elements: the earth element, the water element, the fire element the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. When he knows and sees these six elements, a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements. But Venerable Sir, might there be another way in which a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements? There might be ananda. There are ananda, the six elements, the pleasure element, the pain element, the joy element, the grief element, the equanimity element, and the ignorance element. When he knows and sees these six elements, a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements. Bhante, is this is this the Vedana group? Uh, I just can't. I just don't understand why ignorance is in here. I think it has to do with the relationship 
or the comparison between ignorance and equanimity, because there's this point that an ignorant person or a person steeped in ignorance uh, appears very equanimous, like an animal, say. Animals appear quite equanimous a lot of the time, but it's just the, the cloudiness in the mind and this the intensity of their incapacity to understand, the lack of understanding that uh, prevents them from from uh, presenting strong emotions. It's not that they're equ equanimous, but they appear to be equanimous. And it even appears to them that they're equanimous, like they say, I don't care, but they do care. They're just not able to perceive it. So it appears very similar to equanimity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be considered as a, as a feeling? No, it's an element. So, it's an, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's just this are this is why you don't take things too categorically. One thing we have this sutta kind of we should keep in mind with this sutta, or that this sutta shows that we should always keep in mind with the dhamma is not to be too rigid about our defining of things. And this goes for the abhidhamma as well to not take it too seriously, where you say no, 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 it's exactly this and no other way, because it's much more a teaching sort of thing. It seems to me that the Buddha was much more interested in what was helpful for his students than than in laying down uh, a, a, a immutable doctrine in in most regards. Of course, there's some things where he's very specific that things are immutable, but his his focus was always much more on with lists of things and so on on what's useful for the audience. But they hear the word datu means something unique, right? Unique something. Well, that's an I never heard that. What does datu exactly mean? Probably comes from the root dar, I guess. That which um, that which holds its own, like a dharma, maybe. Actually, I'm not quite sure. What does datu come from? In Thailand, they use the word to mean uh, a literal root, like medicine that's made from roots. They use it for for medicine anyway. Vijita Pali says an element. That is an element, natural condition, a relic, a root, root of a word, humor of the body, faculty of senses. We use the word yeah. datu for relics as well. The tooth relic of the Buddha, sacred tooth yeah. relic of the Buddha. They say that in, in Thai hmm. as well. But element is a good word for what we are read, reading now. Seven. But venerable sir, might there be another way? in which a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements? There might be ananda. There are ananda, these six elements, the sensual desire element, the renunciation element, the ill will element, the non-ill will element, the cruelty element, and the non-cruelty element. When he knows and sees these six elements, a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements. But venerable sir, might there be another way in which a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements? There might be ananda. There are ananda, these three elements. The sense sphere element, the fine material element, the immaterial element. When he knows and sees these three elements, a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the elements. But venerable sir, might there be another way? in which a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the element. There might be ananda, there are ananda, these two elements, the conditioned element and the unconditioned element. When he knows and sees these two elements, a bhikkhu can be called skilled in the element, the basis. But venerable sir, in what way can a bhikkhu be called skilled in the basis? There are ananda, these six internal and external bases, the eye and form, the ear and sound, the nose and odors, the tongue and flavor, the body and tangible, the mind and mind object, when he knows and sees these six internal and external bases, the bhikkhu can be called skilled in the bases. Dependent origination. But venerable sir, in what way can a bhikkhu be called skilled in dependent origination? Here, Ananda, a bhikkhu knows thus. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. 
With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, with ignorance as condition, formations come to be. With formations as condition, consciousness. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base. With the sixfold base as condition, contact. With contact as condition, feeling. With feeling as condition, craving. With craving as condition, clinging. With clinging as condition, being. With being as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Such is, such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. But with the rem, remain, remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of formations. With the cessation of formations, cessation of consciousness, with the cessation of consciousness, cessation of mentality, materiality. With the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of the sixfold base. With the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of being. With the cessation of being, cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. In this way, Ananda, a bhikkhu can be called skilled, independent origination. This is this is a chanting, right? Uh, from. Avidya Pachaya Sankara Sankara Pachaya Vinyana Vinyana Pachaya Nama Rupan. It's commonly chanted, yeah. Often chanted at funerals in Thailand, I think, or in Southeast Asia. This, this is so familiar to me, <laughs> all of these, this uh, paragraph. It's a good one to, re- to chant if you're going to chant anything, to recite, to remember. A good one. I do this every time. The possible and the impossible. But Venerable Sir, in what way can a bhikkhu be called skilled in what is possible and what is impossible? Here, Ananda, a bhikkhu understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person possessing right view could treat any formation as permanent. There is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might treat some formation as permanent. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person possessing right view could treat any formation as pleasurable. There is no such possibility. And he understands, it is possible that an ordinary person might treat some formation as pleasurable. There is such a possibility. He understands, it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person possessing right view could treat anything as self. There is no such possibility. And he understands, it is possible that an ordinary person might treat something as self. There is such a possibility. It doesn't actually say impossible, and I don't know if I'm splitting hairs or not, but I don't know if there is room to say that he's not literally saying this is impossible or possible. I'm not trying to make a point with this passage at all. I'm just, it is worth pointing out maybe that the language is that there is no base, basically. There is no basis for it. And it's not that he said this cannot happen, there's no opportunity. And then he says, uh, you cannot find a basis for it. I mean, it sounds very much like he's saying it's impossible, but he doesn't use that word. Sometimes when he says this, that I guess at any rate, the point might be that the, the, it's not a matter of whether it's impossible. It's it's about talking about what is, um, where the relationship lies. Well, that's not a fair way to put it either. Basically, what is what what is logical or what what is um, based on on the causes what what res- what consequence you can expect from the cause it, basically oh. saying it's impossible i think it's probably not not worth laboring that point um, until we talked about this and and you said like this this word at atana metam is uh, what what impossible means or not possible it's their way of saying it it's the way that we see that we understand to mean possible and impossible. 
Tana means base. Like in English, we use the word basis. There is a basis or there is no basis. It doesn't actually say impossible or possible. It's a, it's a bit um, strong to say something is possible or impossible. So in speech, it, it might be a matter of using a little bit less forceful speech. Because there's one instance here where it does appear that it's not fair to say possible or impossible relating to whether it's possible or impossible for a person to go to a good destination. Sorry, just a second. In uh, one of the uh, tra singleist translation, it says uh, there are no reasons to take for a, a person with right view to take sanskara as uh, mm -hmm. pleasurable. It, it sounds like uh, this passage describes a sotapanna, basically. I mean, at least the sotapanna. I think a sotapanna can have uh, uh, the perception and thoughts of uh, something, sensual pleasures being pleasurable, but he will not have the view that it is uh, sukha. 13. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could deprive his mother of life. There is no such possibility, and he understands. It is possible that an ordinary person might deprive his mother of life. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person possessing right view could deprive his father of life, could deprive an arhant of life. There is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary, ordinary person might deprive his father of life, might deprive an arhant of life. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could, with a mind of hate, shed a Tathagata's blood. There is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might, with a mind of hate, shed a Tathagata's blood. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could cause a schism in the Sangha, could acknowledge another teacher, there is no such a possibility, and he understands. It is possible that an ordinary person might cause a schism in the Sangha, might acknowledge another teacher, there is such a possibility. 14. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that two accomplished ones, fully enlightened ones, could arise contemporaneously in one world system. There is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that <clears throat> one accomplished one, a fully enlightened one, might arise in one world system. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that two will turning monarchs could arise contemporaneously in one world system. It is possible that one wheel turning monarch might arise in one world system. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a woman could be in an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. There is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that a man might be an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a woman could be a wheel-turning monarch, that a woman could occupy the position of Saka, that a woman could occupy the position of Mara, that a woman could occupy the position of Brahma. There is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that a man might be a wheel-turning monarch, that a man might occupy the position of Saka, that a man might occupy the position of Mara that a man might occupy the position of Brahma. There is such a possibility. It's possible for Pachika Buddhas to arise at the same time, right? Yes. And uh, it's not possible for the enlightened one. Um, yeah, it's, the, the word, it's a, not a great translation to say fully enlightened one, but just to clarify, the word is Samma Sambuddha, which means, I mean, it's, I guess it's okay, but it's important to realize uh, be honest, fully fully awakened. Well, it depends what you mean by it, but it can be referring just to an arahant. 
fully self-awakened, some sama, some Buddha, a rightly self-awakened uh, one. I would say awakened Buddha. I would translate. I wouldn't translate that. Otherwise, it's confusing because Buddha can be used to refer to anyone who has become awakened. Of course, I mean the word technically, but when you use the word Buddha, you know you're referring to a specific individual, the Sama Sam Buddha. For the passage about women, um, I don't know what to make of it exactly, except that it probably has less to do with the specific reality of being a woman and more to do with the way genders are constructed in society, the way women are uh, generally placed in society as being less uh, free, less uh, autonomous, the, how, 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 how a woman is constructed and how it, how it shapes one's mental activity and so on. I mean, it, there's, it's, not a, it's not a deficiency so much as a as a, I guess, still a limitation because of how men are given autonomy and power and control. Because you can see these are all sort of dominant positions. It, the commentary talks about Brahma, for example. A woman can, of course, go to become a Brahma when they pass away. They just can't be reborn as Maha Brahma, sort of the leader of the Brahmas. I'm not sure why it is about Maras, but, and again, it, it's it's kind of, Perhaps less that it's impossible and more that it's just not the way things go. I guess what I don't understand here, Bante, is that how is this um, uh, is related to right view? Is it is it still related to one who possesses right view knows that these positions won't be uh, for a, for a woman for a, yeah. No, this is not talking about right view. This is talking about someone who knows what is possible and what is impossible. And only a yeah. Buddha really knows what is impossible. It's one of the special qualities of a Buddha. So, I, I mean, I don't want to excuse misogyny or sexism. I just, I don't know how to really grapple with this or whether it should just be dismissed. Or There's certainly been uh, some uh, argument about whether a woman... In, in the Mahayana, women who want to make uh, determinations to become female Buddhas, and there's a movement, or there are, there are people interested in that. And there is, both in Mahayana and Theravada, this idea that it's not possible for a Buddha to be female. So I, I guess I, I don't, I'm not trying to defend it or, or explain it. I don't really understand precisely what's going on here. The universe is strange, so it does seem a little bit strange that the female faculty would somehow have anything to do with being a Buddha. So it's, it seems much more like it's a social sort of construct, like in the Buddha's time for a woman to become king is just laughable. Bhante, do Maras have bodily form? Yes, they're devas. Is it desired to be Mara? No, no he's not talking about what's desired, and that's sort of yeah, the point. It's more talking about positions of power. And I guess Maras are sort of in a position of power because they have influence over others, or they have a relationship in terms of being interested in the creations of others. I don't really know. Well, a woman, a woman can become a Buddha if she's born as a man. And also, um, unlit, uh, every unlit, what, kind of a, unlit, what, kind of a, what kind of a sentence is that? I mean, uh, every, every man can be born a woman unless uh, they are... Well, that's a good point. Is there's no, there is no such thing as a man or a woman. It's a, it's particular to a specific birth. So if you're in a birth where you have the female physical form, uh, I don't know. I mean, people will conjecture about the the, the female. I, no, I don't. I don't want to even go there. <laughs> I mean, it's somewhat similar to saying that uh, only women can uh, give birth to children. Men cannot. So it's the way of nature. Yeah, but and that's a, similar that's, limitation applies when it comes of, to that's a way of physical nature. Becoming a Buddha it shouldn't have anything to do with the physical. There is the commentary does make mention of the 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 marks of a great person and that a woman can't have all the marks. But it's kind of so that's kind of circular reasoning. When you make the marks to be a male body, then of course a female body can't have them. I'm not convinced really. So it probably has something to do with the uh... Being the dominant uh, sex in society, yeah. yeah, and it grows up because of 
women having to give birth and being limited. Pregnancy is, of course, somewhat debilitating, and it leads to a need for dependency that that the gen the sex that doesn't have to give birth doesn't require. Even if you consider the practical issues, like uh, if uh, imagine if a bodhisattva, if uh, it was a princess who had to leave the palace and go to the forest in search of uh, uh, freedom from suffering, it wouldn't be possible for a woman to do that in that uh, during that time. Why not? And it's because uh, women are under uh, the protection of uh, males, so father, social, husband. A social construct. And also, women, uh, it's not secure for women to go alone in the forest. For men, it's not a well, that's big still issue. kind of a construct because women can be stronger than men. It's, po it's possible. And that was kind of what I was thinking about when I said possible, impossible. That's not what the Buddha is saying. So could it technically be possible? I think that's not really what the Buddha is focused on. He's just saying, you know, it's, that it just doesn't happen, practically speaking. It's like the part, I think it's coming up, where he says it's not possible, or he says it's not, there's no basis for someone doing good deeds going to hell. But it's certainly possible for a person who does all sorts of good deeds to go to hell. We know this. It just means they have to have done some bad deeds as well. So it's not quite, the focus isn't quite on what is possible or impossible. And I guess just probably better not to get hung up on this. I'm not trying to dismiss sexism, and I guess it certainly exists in Buddhism to the point where it's actually quite unwholesome. I mean, Buddhist societies and culture and monastic societies and that sort of thing. So there's no excuse for that. I mean, yeah, if women want to become Buddha, by all means, go for it. <laughs> if yeah, it is possible. Dalai Lama said something said that something similar to that. He said, yeah, someone told him she wanted to become a female Buddha. He said, go for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's important not to get hung up on gender or sex or that sort of thing. It's just a uh, very small but, but part it of it. But it would be a little too much to say go for it, knowing that uh, it is an unrealistic goal according to the text. Well, he may not have said go for it, but I, I don't think that's wrong. I mean, probably I would say something like forget about the woman-man thing and probably forget about being the Buddha, focus on what's important. Absolutely. But uh, Bhante, you said that only a Buddha knows uh, what is possible or impossible ultimately. And then this uh, whole topic started out like, how can a bhikkhu be skilled in uh, knowing what's possible and impossible? Then is it is it through pra practice? What 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 is required for this? Well, ultimately, Buddhahood, but. You can become skilled, just not perfect. So again, you, it's not he's not using the words impossible, but you get a, you get a sense of what has basis and what doesn't have basis. What are the requisites for certain I results? I think it, the problem is if you if uh, if for example if someone becomes a sotapanna and he does he never takes a view that a woman can become a Buddha when clearly the Buddha has said mentioned that it is not possible. So maybe, maybe that's an example. So through no learning. Yes. He didn't say impossible. He said there's no basis. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a wished for, desired, agreeable result could be produced from bodily misconduct, from verbal misconduct, from mental misconduct. There's no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that an unwished for undesired, disagreeable results might be produced from bodily misconduct, from verbal misconduct, from mental misconduct. There's such a possibility. He understands it's impossible. It can happen that an unwished for, undesired, disagreeable results could be produced from good bodily conduct, from good verbal conduct, from good mental conduct. There's no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that a wish for desired agreeable results might be produced from good bodily conduct, from good verbal conduct, from good mental conduct. There is such a possibility. 18. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person engaging in bodily misconduct, engaging in verbal misconduct, engaging in mental misconduct, 
could on that account, for that reason, on the dissolution of the body after death, reappear in a happy destination. Even in the heavenly world, there is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that a person engaging in bodily misconduct, engaging in verbal misconduct, engaging in mental misconduct might on that account, for that reason, on the dissolution of the body after death, appear in a state of deprivation, in unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. There is such a possibility. Uh, so you understand. My, mis- my mistake, this says specifically because of that, because of that, with that as the cause. So it does it, it does basically imply that it's impossible, and that holds up because you can't be born in hell because of good deeds. Of course. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person engaging in good bodily conduct, engaging in good verbal conduct, engaging in good mental conduct could on that account, for that reason, on the dissolution of the body after death, appear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. There is no such possibility. And he understands it is possible that a person engaging in good bodily conduct, engaging in good verbal conduct, engaging in good mental conduct, might on that account, for that reason, on the dissolution of the body, after death, appear in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world. In this way, Ananda, a bhikkhu, can be called skilled in what is possible, and what is impossible. Conclusion. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, It is wonderful, Venerable Sir. It is marvelous. What is the name of this discourse on the Dhamma? You may remember this discourse on the Dhamma, Ananda, as the many kinds of elements, or as the four cycles, and as the mirror of the Dhamma, and as the drum of the deathless, and as the supreme victory in battle. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Um, Hello, Bhante. I have a question about Mara. Um, I was wondering if Mara can use other people. Like some people, they say like they're possessed. Possession is apparently a thing possible for the brain to be controlled by another being. There is a, uh, I don't know if it's a sutta or a dhammapada or which one, um, when um, Venerable Mahamogalana is uh, telling Mara that he was an, uh, in a previous life um, Mara and that he, he influenced um, people of the village to harm an arahant or something and that... Uh, Brought him to hell, actually. Yeah, that's the Maratajani Sutta, I think. It's a sutta. Yeah. So it is possible, I think. Yeah, but that's not probably possession. That's manipulation. Mm-hmm. Influence. One time, uh, Mara uh, possessed a boy and uh, threw a stone at uh, one of the chief disciples of the, I think, Buddha Kasapa. And he got injured because of that. It's. I mean, there's two ways. One is the literal taking over of the body, and the other is just how a, a, a human can manipulate another human. Mara is, of course, more skillful than humans. Um, so when we talk about possession, Bante, isn't that more like uh, the um, demons or or asuras or ghosts? Right. Yeah. Talk about demon possession. I mean, demons can do it. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Mara and the uh, angels in the highest realm can uh, should be able to do it very easily because demons belong to the lowest realm. Yeah, I don't know. Possibly. I mean, it's not very wholesome to do it, I don't think. There's a funny story about a dead body. Uh, a person dies and the body is put in, is thrown into the charnel ground wrapped in a cloth. And the ghost is hanging around, kind of still clinging to the body. And this monk comes up and wants to take the cloth to make a robe. So oh, this is a nice cloth. And he picks up the, the robe and the ghost gets really angry and gets back into its body. And the body stands up and chases the monk. Give me my robe back. And the monk runs away and runs into his, his, his kuti and closes the door. And the ghost, the, the body comes to the doorway and 
sees the door is closed and just the bo- it leaves the body and the body falls down dead. And when he comes out later, he sees the dead body sitting on his, his porch. Actually, not really quite related to what we're talking about, but sort of tangentially. Strange things happen. Are demons considered devas? No. Yak, uh, yakka, yakkas, if you translate yakka as demon, they are part of the lowest uh, heaven in uh, Chatur Maharajika. Oh, are they? I thought they were asuras. Uh, they are the asuras uh, who belong to the uh, heavens, but there are different kind of asuras. Well, then they're not devas. Yeah, but they do belong to the Chatur Maharajika. Right. The yakkas. There's a relationship. I mean, it's complicated. I, I, it's not quite as cut and dried as we might make it because the asuras are supposed to supposed to have been in have been devas at one point, and they were kicked out because mm-hmm. they got them drunk and kicked them out. I mean, uh, uh, King Bim- I don't know about that story either. King Bimbisara is born as a yakka uh, in Chatur Maharaj, if I remember right. He's a sotapanna. A yakka? I don't think a yakka. Uh, that's interesting. You might be right, but it seems strange to me. A yaka? I know he was uh, born yes, lower, but as a yaka, really? Yeah. Uh, under one of the... There are four guardian kings of the directions. They are yakko, yakas, and The kings of yakas. Four guardian ages. And he is born under one of them. Mm. The deep digital... The dictionary probably proper name says... Nothing is said about his future destiny. Why do we say he's a Sotapanna? We know he was a Sotapanna, right? Why do we say he... Or it's Bimbisara, who was reborn in, yeah, Chattu Maharaj as, as a Yakka. Such a surprise. So Yakkas are like... Low, they don't have the same radiance uh, as regular Devas, but they are also mm-hmm. heavenly beings with uh, magical powers. So Devas. Hmm. Funny how we treat them as differently. Oh no, he doesn't have to have been born as a deva. What is it considered? What is, a yaka? I guess it's a different category of being. Yeah, it's a miscellaneous one. So it, it, in, uh, in the book I'm searching in. The yakas are asuras belonging to the hell, like not the, the hell. Thetas can be called yakas also, it looks like. Saka is also called a yaka at one point. That's also alavaka. He was also called a yaka. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like a term that doesn't have any rigid meaning. It's used in different contexts. It's even used to describe human beings in certain cases. Mm-hmm. Prince Vijay came to Sri Lanka. The uh, indigenous people were also called Yakka or Yakka worshippers, devil worshippers. Hmm. Yeah, there's indigenous groups in Thailand that, that don't worship, but they propitiate, or however you say it, they perform ceremonies. Keep the evil spirits from from hate from hurting them. So they, it's not quite worship. It's more like appeasement. Still pretty awful. They kill. They, they slaughter animals and do all these ritual chantings. Uh, but I have a question, um, possibly regarding the yakas. So in our meditation tradition, let's say it's the the image or the image of the yak comes up in meditation and you know we notice it as seeing, seeing, seeing or, or how are we experiencing it and then it disappears. Um does that suggest it was mentally created or did it exist in of itself? Um so so is there a possibility of it just being a mental creation or does it always come up as a being in of itself that is being seen? In meditation, we're not concerned with why things come up. We're only concerned with this, with what comes up. Uh-huh. The only real causes we're interested in are uh, causes of suffering. Sometimes when you go to the go to monasteries uh, near forests, and if you go to the forest for meditation, you might see uh, like scary figures while meditating. Some people uh, have reported seeing them while they are meditating in the forest, but when they are meditating inside the room, no such thing. So it could be that uh, there are spirits in the forest uh, who are trying to scare them away. It can also be your overactive imagination, and nine times out of ten probably is your overactive imagination. Could be. Buddha said that 
forests are scary. Living in the forest is very strange. The sounds you hear, it's very foreign if, you have, if you're not accustomed to it. It scares people. It would have been a lot more scary when there were tigers roaming about and snakes, poisonous snakes. Well, in Sri Lanka, you still have forests with at least wild boars that will skewer, skewer you and lots of poisonous snakes. Yeah, one of my cousins caught a cobra just a few days ago, just near my oh, the cobra. place. Well, I was, the monk I was living with, his, when he was young, his sister was bitten and killed by a cobra when they were children. Um, Bhante, I, it's been on my mind a lot while meditating, and it's a little bit of a hindrance. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Um, it's, it's along the lines of his question. Um, when we're meditating and we see things, we hear things, um, I know you say it's just seeing, hearing, but I get preoccupied with like, Am I tapping into other realms? Like, is that possible? Like, is that real when we hear that on the internet, that we're tapping into other realms? Um, it, it would help me, like, maybe just move beyond that fear. Like, is, is that, is, can that really happen so that I can just move beyond that? <laughs> Sorry. Well, you shouldn't try to, I'm, I'm not going to give you good answers, unfortunately, or good answers, but I think they're good answers, but not the answers you're looking for. You shouldn't try to move beyond fear. You should face the fear. But the point is the answers you're looking for are not actually going to be all that helpful. So I could speculate and say certain things are possible and certain things are not possible, but it's not the best way to look at the situation. It's because all my life, like I've had these, uh, so to speak, paranormal experiences, and I've kept them to myself. Um, I never talked about them because... I was afraid of judgment and things like that. But the more that I meditate, the more that I experience things. And so it's just like it causes a bit of confusion. That's why like I would like some answers. I'm not looking for, I'm not seeking anything and I don't not want them and I don't want them. I just want to shed light from someone that I trust since you're my yeah, meditation well, teacher, yeah. it's more in that respect. Experiences don't cause confusion. The confusion is still a reaction. It's just something you should know. You um, should, I mean, trying to find find answers about facts is not really all that useful. You should try to find answers about your reactions. And if it's confused, then just say confused. Yeah. But also the fear is, is more important, really. Well, I've come to realize from meditating that if I don't have answers to my question. Like I feel insecure and scared. So, and I'm trying to. to well, that's not the reason for the fear. The fear is a uh, probably based control on as well. Delusion. Is no, it possible fear is, that fear is delu I mean, any unwholesomeness is based on delusion. It's just lack of clarity in the mind. Try and see what it is that triggers the fear, and when you see that thing clearly, you you, you won't be afraid of it. Is it possible that it has to do with control, feeling that I don't have control if I, but it's a false sense of control, but not knowing I feel powerless? Well, we want control to, to protect us from what we're afraid of. So there's a relationship, but it's not, fear isn't lack of control. Fear is the aversion towards something. You have a thought arise of what might happen, like losing control, being vulnerable, that sort of thing. You'll figure it out if you just be mindful, just not the fear. Uh, probably yeah. ultimately, I know it sounds a bit intense to say, but it probably ultimately comes to dying, like afraid of death ultimately. Can be. I mean, there's. we have to make proxies. Like it could have, something could have been originally because of something, like say death, and then over time it evolves so that the thing that made you think of the, the possibility of dying becomes the source of the fear. It's like uh, conditioning, like these dogs that were were fed, but when they were fed, the scientists would ring a bell. And every time they fed them, they rang, they rang the bell. And so eventually all they had to do was ring the bell and the dogs started salivating. It's a very simple uh, experiment that you know shows how conditioning works. Eventually something unrelated can become the source of fear or any of the emotions. Thank you, Bante. Also, why why fear seeing 
other world things i mean isn't it cool <laughs> to see something other people can't see well there can often be a, a sort of a interest in them either positive or negative that's really what creates the ch- the problem with such things that there's some interest it can be interest in seeing them come or interest in seeing them go it's just the excitement whatever kind of excitement it is that's why nibida is so important when you just lose interest in them and you can't just try and avoid them in order to lose interest losing interest comes from under, from seeing them so clearly that you see how un, uninteresting they are um sanka i would say that cool is when it's it's like novel it's new it's different but just like anything when something becomes habitual it it's it becomes normal it's it's not cool or interesting i would say that's just my perspective another one and i don't i'm not trying to imply that it's your case but it, you know just in case and just for interest is uh, with such things there can develop uh, ego like conceit a uh, feeling that there's something special that you have that other people don't and it can be subtle but it is something that you see in people who have special experiences the over time it becomes a sort of an identity thing where you have these uh, i i doesn't sound like that's a real problem with you but always something to keep in mind ante i i have a pali question and um, could you please explain the word patimoka like um break it up and what would be the most literal translation pati moka well moka is is freedom pati it's uh pati is like a specify specifically or or relating to that thing so relating to freedom thank you one thing it's hard i mean words are so malleable that it's hard to say exactly what people understood from that word when the buddha used it he used it in two related cases like the patimoka wasn't the rules the patimoka was the, the the teaching on the holiday so before the rules the teaching on the holiday was what we know as the avada patimoka in the in the dhammapada sambapapa sakaranam kusala sopa sampada and so on but eventually when the rules arose it changed so that the patimoka was the rules so they would recite the rules instead patimoka doesn't actually the word itself doesn't have anything to do with rules as far as i understand it's the maybe you could say the essence of liberation which again doesn't have anything to do with the rules but it's 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 like the thing that the pinnacle that was taught on the on the on the posita so the uvata patimoka is really the patimoka but eventually because it was replaced they kept the same name that's that's how my guess of how it works so the rules were eventually called the patimoka but in the text it's actually called the matika there's the dwe matika the two lists really and uh, there's the list for the bhikkhus and the list for the bhikkhunis and even called the patimoka there it is a good reminder probably one reason for keeping it is because It's a reminder that the rules are not something to cling to or be content with that you should only be using the rules as a support for liberation patimoksha patimoka the reason why it's lengthened is because it's a nominative root for that which is for the purpose of liberation something like that i'm actually not sure the derivation but the a in pat the a in patti becomes pati If I may I have one last question Bonte it's about pronunciation in the word mu um in the five precepts musawada do we say, I hear a v when that word is spoken is it a v sound or a w more like a w and another word that I hear a v sound um a poly word is deva would we is it deva or dewa or is that an exception the word deva no it's deva it's a v sound no it's more like a w okay deva can you not hear deva well i don't know those two words for some reason i'm hearing a v sound so i just wanted to check because i know that usually we say a w sound for v when it's poly words but those two words i was getting hung up 
then I was hearing V. It's interesting. In my language, there is no W. So to me, it all sounds the same. When you pronounce V, you have to, the upper teeth has to touch the bottom lip or something. What? W, yeah. When you, when you pronounce V, V sound, uh, the top teeth. There's no, there's no V because of exactly what Sanka is saying, because they don't use the teeth against the lip. V, V, V. Thai doesn't have it either. Does Singhala have a V sound? Yeah, we have a V sound, but uh, there is no W sound <laughs> that is unique. Just use yeah, what's the W sound now? I'm curious. <laughs> well, it's a labial, it's the lips. You use the two lips, w, w. Yeah. Or V, you use one, one lip with the teeth, V. Sanka, yeah. what symbols do you use? Do you use a V and a W, or it looks different? I use the Singhala word. <laughs> I don't know whether. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it, W is better or V is better. Sawada. Sawada where money. Uh, yeah, my top thing uh, is changing a little bit. The commentary says Pati Moka doesn't come from the prefix Pati. It comes from Pati, which means uh, it's a stretch. Interesting, though. It says it comes from Pati, which means to watch. In other words, to guard. When you guard them, they make you free. So guarding that leads to liberation, mokka. Yeah, except you can't put a you can't put a root you can, or you can't put a verb body like that. You can't put a, a verb at the beginning of the word. I don't know what's going on there. Verbs, verbal forms can't go in in compounds like that. Well, you, there's always rules are always made to be broken in grammar, but in language. Yes, actually, God, I, I at think first. it's. Sorry, I think it's just a way of remembering a word. Some of the derivations that they have in the commentaries are just means of remembering and ways of thinking of them. They're not actually etymological. It, because at first I thought it was the regular uh, prefix pati. So to be like inclined towards something or to to face something. I don't know if that's even correctly translated. No, pati is usually used for like specifically... Speaking of possession, you can also get a spirit to move a certain body part of you. There's, there are certain techniques to get the uh, spirits to write on a paper somewhere. Like, like the Ouija board. Yeah. I used to try that uh, a lot as a kid. My guess is it's much more a, a, a physical thing. A lot of what we think is mental is actually physical, the brain. Brain has some autonomous, some capacity to act autonomously. Yeah, that could be the case as well. Um, I have a question um, in relation to your latest video about illness, Fante. Uh, when one part you say that physical well-being uh, reflects or often, I mean, is in a correlation with mental well-being. And uh, I guess I want some clarification on that because um, I often meet uh, like disabled people who seem to me like they are really okay and uh, some very healthy people who are really not okay mentally. Yeah, it's more related to how the, how the condition affects the mind. I mean, if, if it's a condition that has no, or sorry, affects the brain, not the mind, how, how the condition affects the brain. Many disabilities have nothing to do with brain function. Mm -hmm. Some I disabilities do actually affect the brain, or some conditions like traumatic brain injury, for example. There's cases of traumatic brain injury where people, their whole personality changes. Mm -hmm. So there still is a distinction between what they experience and how they experience and how they react to their experience. But the change is just overwhelming and because of their lack of capacity to be mindful, it changes how they react as well. And they can become very angry people when they weren't before, or vice versa. I mean, angry people can, I guess, I, I hear more, heard more about people who suddenly have anger issues that they never had before. Like you hear about uh, ex-football players who, who have psychotic rages and kill people. That's American football. Well, yeah, they get a lot of head trauma, I think. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't clear from the video at all, to me, at 
that this refers to the brain as uh, isn't it a case for a lot of uh, younger women monthly they get irritated a lot during certain periods certain <laughs> days <laughs> it's another sexist statement for you yes no i mean there is apparently a thing where it's more challenging there's hormonal changes as well i guess but i mean this is a good point that it's all just physical and it still depends on the individual it makes it harder i mean it makes more more physical stress and or can for some people because if there's there's cramping and pain as well as uh, they're kind of t- feeling tired i guess feeling bloated those sorts of things i mean even non even conditions that aren't related to the brain can affect you but it's much less of a direct correlation because certain people's physical disabilities can make them more introspective, more thoughtful, more wise, whereas people, as it says, who have perfect physical health can be terrible people, often with some relationship to their physical health because of how uh, arrogant they become and how careless yeah. and ignorant to the potential suffer. Yeah, and what I... I was referring to was the how the bodies the bodily systems can affect the brain and the, can create experiences in different ways even certain foods or certain things you you intake partake of like alcohol but even without intaking anything the physical body can do things schizophrenics uh, i mean the idea was more to talk about things like that schizophrenics are are they are unable to prevent I mean it's not a matter of being mi- more mindful they're still going to experience things that ordinary people don't experience and those can be very challenging and very very triggering and easily lead to chronic paranoia and that sort of thing I I really don't know much about mental like really mentally ill people I will admit that I just want to also just say to 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 what I know uh when even even just um, family members of these disabled people or even just their friends and many people just go through a transformation, a very beautiful transformation where they are more prone to helping and uh, just very conscious um, with other people and, and just uh, you, you can see... Uh, a friendliness and a loving kindness uh, type of thing uh, there surrounding them and sur- even even just even who like just tangentially are around them and so on. so I I didn't really get like why is that um, because if someone is I don't know in a bad physical situation. It, I I would understand from that video that then their mental would be the same and it just didn't make sense to yeah, me. Sorry, I don't but... think that's what I said. I mean, it was more okay. in very specific instances. The brain is uh, responsible for mental. Physical can create mental, can give rise to mental. I mean, it's not. It's more complicated than a one to one, but. Mm-hmm. It's that the brain is physical. I think that was included in the video talking about how the brain is physical. And we we often think of much of what happens with the brain as being the mental, but it's not. And so being squarely in the realm of physical, there's there's a connection there. There are consequences to physical illness, some physical illnesses for the brain, which then affects the experiences of the mind. Now we were talking about, I think the video talks about how uh, the brain is a filter for the mind, and so if the filter's not working correctly, that's I think explicitly stated in the video. So even uh, severe things like headaches and uh, uh, drowsiness can make a person uh, treat other people uh, unkindly. Like if somebody's talking sure. to you while you're having a headache, you just shoot them. Sure. And get, get it wasn't them. really what I was thinking of. I was thinking more of a. Dis- uh, uh, a, something more severe like schizophrenia. Just to say that schizophrenia is considered a mental illness, but m- part of it is organic, is physical. Mm-hmm. That's the idea. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification, Bante. Bante, uh, did you say that um, physical health is correlated with mental health? 
Yeah, it's complicated both ways. Mental health, of course, affects the physical, but the physical can affect the mental. There is a relationship. There's other like other things that we we don't realize as Buddhists that um, well, traumatic brain injury is one of them, but also uh, partial lobotomies really are cause strange uh, experiences in the mind. But uh, it doesn't where, where... it doesn't mean causation, right? Dante, because of the other factors are influencing. The outcome it means causation but it's complicated it's not one-to-one -one, this causes that there's lots of factors and there's lots of lots of results as well results are momentary so causes and results are only one moment causes another moment or one moment is followed by another moment it's very complicated some physical health can also bring wisdom do you think like well not directly being blind but it can certainly be a, a a strong object of contemplation no physical can't bring it, it but it can it can be a catalyst for someone who is predisposed to question in such a way that they bring about understanding but the same experience can bring about resentment and unwholesomeness in another person person who believes in creationism can uh, be depressed why did god uh, treat me badly and give other people sight not me yeah. I mean, yeah, I think I think a similar thing probably goes if you don't believe in God and just think it's random, like, boy, did I get unlucky, or boy, did I get lucky, or that sort of thing. Really kind of kind of depressing <laughs> to understand. I, th I think one of the important things is to understand the uh, eternity, the fact that w whatever position condition you're in now is not permanent, that uh, life goes on and life changes, and the situation you're in is is easily, well, not easily, is explainable based on causes, conditions, and is temporary. Because if you change the causes and conditions or careful with them, then future is, the future changes as well. So, uh, Bhante, would, uh, would Buddhism recognize um, different types of mental illnesses, like, um, I don't know, minor ones, like uh, narcissistic uh, disorders? For example, I don't understand the question. I mean, Buddhism, of course, recognizes narcissism for what it is. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd be careful about talking about things as being disorders, like uh, an actual. Well, illness might be an okay way of looking at them, um, but they're not something like it would be. It would be a bad thing to think of it as something inherent to the organism. Like we think of schizophrenia, yeah, like there are, there are physical conditions that are inherent that you can't really become unschizophrenic. I mean, it, it may be true that it's not possible in this life, just like you can't, um, you know, muscular dystrophy, you can't suddenly become unmuscular dystrophy unless mm -hmm. some new technology arises. But um, for things like narcissism, that can change. Yeah, exactly why I asked the question. So uh, I was thinking too, like that's not a disorder or something. It's just someone being very, I don't know, egotistic or just the delusion part is, uh, yeah, is different. It's a, the, the problem is where you, where people make it categorical, where no, no, this is an actual disorder, as though yeah, that somehow makes it somehow problem. more real than a person who is mildly narcissistic, right? Or depression. I am depressed, but I am clinically depressed. As though calling it clinically means something. Like, no, no, now it's no longer something you could treat with meditation, for example. But again, there is a physical component. And the, the different people's brains are better able to, to uh, experience happiness. Like brains are just their makeup. And I don't know whether that evolves over one's life, but it seems like there is some potential for for changing the brain. But um, certain people can be very easily satisfied, easy to please. Other people are very hard to please simply because of the way the brain works, the brain's capacity to feel happiness, feel pleasure, not feel, that's not fair. The brain's potential to allow the mind to feel pleasure. Yeah, I think we talked about um, um, psychopaths, right? The, their issues also with the brain. Yeah, psychopathy is interesting. I think probably is not monolithic in terms of all, all psychopaths are, are one and the same, 
or psychopathy is actually a thing because it <laughs> seems to be a fairly just fairly extreme dissociation from uh, the evil of, of of or the cruelty the unwholesomeness of one's mind lack of ability to well be mindful really to the point that you don't feel bad about being evil there's studies that have been done on psychopaths or sociopaths that say that they actually do feel remorse it's not true that so true psychopathy or what we call i guess whatever the word is where a person feels no zero remorse is not actually real um, I mean, temporarily of course you, you don't feel remorse all the time but the lack of consequences mentally is not really real doing evil does affect the person who does it no matter what but yeah i think the point is and probably what you're trying what you're getting at is it can all be explained as very extreme forms of what the buddha talked about i don't think there's anything really mysterious or categorically different or outside of the realm of what the buddha talked about except in terms of how it's related to the physical and that's the point is that some things are not curable through meditation like schizophrenia i think probably isn't the, the part of schizophrenia that is the hallucinations probably isn't because it's probably physical paranoia the anger the fear all of that that you could cure but also the with mindfulness let's say a person a schizophrenic person um learns how to be present and differentiate between oh this is real and this is hallucination then they can get on just fine no like yeah that's the theory i don't know that i've ever seen anyone prove it or show it but yeah the thing is the the physical the brain um evokes experiences and can make experiences very hard to deal with but it cannot make you angry it can the brain cannot make you angry or greedy or deluded brain doesn't have that capacity mm -hmm. so traumatic brain injury doesn't excuse someone getting angry though it does make it more understandable that an ordinary person would suddenly become different it can also cause you to of course lose memories so be unable to access certain memories and uh, there's even cases where it causes people to speak with different accents like there was this case of someone i think who suddenly started speaking with a different accent it's just really bizarre asanda visuddhi marga se bante the ordinary person is like a madman something like umatka hmm. well, it does 